The path that leadeth on is lighted by one fire, the light of daring burning in the heart. The more one dares, the more he shall obtain. Welcome to the fourth episode in this series on Awakening the Chakras. Thank you everyone for keeping up with the series and all the positive comments, especially from those who are saying it's just making so much sense to you and really contributing to your own progression and you're seeing the benefits of certain practices and how understanding what's being discussed here is really helping you. That's exactly why I make these videos to support a wide variety of information that's often misunderstood in several ways in order to help those who are seeking it and seeking to make sense of all this. And thank you for your patience waiting every week for each episode. If I was able to pause time and make them all at once, I would, but I am only human and I'm working on these every week. They take time, especially because for each episode I could easily make them three hours long, but that's not ideal, so I have to kind of wisely choose what the best information is to include in each video in order to make it effective but also concise. Uh, with that said, you are absolutely free to ask me any question about the other chakras and any other kind of related topic outside of what I'm including in this series. Uh, you can leave a comment if you want, but if you want a deeper and more elaborate answer, you can ask me directly in voice chat in our twice a month Q&A events in Discord. Simply join on Patreon to support the channel and you'll have access to the community. Okay, so make sure you're subscribed and click the bell icon so you're notified every time I post a new video and let's get into it. So this episode will cover the solar plexus Manipura chakra, the church of Pergamos, located in the pancreas gland, or is also sometimes associated with the kidneys. Manipura in Sanskrit literally means city of jewels. Hence, to master this chakra is also to master how to manifest things in your life, whether it's money, relationships, academic work, or most importantly, spiritual enlightenment, which are the real jewels, of course, as opposed to material jewels. So all of the popular spiritual communities, such as the Law of Attraction, who are trying to figure out how to get things done and manifest whatever they want, are actually working within or trying to figure out the dimension of this Manipura Chakra. Another couple of interesting abilities that are naturally developed here are telepathy and other psychic phenomena, and also perfect health and longevity. More on these later. This chakra is the colour yellow, like gold, and also like the sun and fire, and it is the highest and most superior chakra of the three lower inferior chakras. So from here on out, we'll be very much diving into the realms of enlightenment in various levels and also going into understanding how certain spiritual abilities such as clairvoyance, clairaudience and clairsentience naturally occur. This solar plexus chakra is the element of fire and is also intimately tied to our heart chakra. The heart chakra is commonly known as the element of air, so these chakras actually work together because fire needs air to be maintained. But we also commonly relate fire to the heart, and even see in depictions of Jesus' heart on fire representing his love for God, his burning passion for God. So, where does this fire come from if the heart is the element of air? Well, it first comes from our solar plexus chakra, which is the chakra of desire. So, these flames of desire rise up into the heart where there's air and space for that fire to exist. Fire rises, right? So, we can say that the solar plexus is desire, and the heart is where that desire is transformed into love, manifesting our desires more intensely, whether it's uh, spiritual desires or material desires. So, as you can see by the quote by Helena Blavatsky at the start of this episode, she's saying that 
The more we desire awakening and act on that desire through will and intent, the more we shall receive awakening. And as we'll see, the solar plexus is all about will and intent. So it's quite nice how she used the word daring, which is essentially a combination of desire and willpower. And we'll see more on this with the heart chakra episode. And to also briefly link the heart and the solar plexus to the root and sacral chakras, those first two chakras are sort of the deep, gross furnace laboratories down under where we need to do all of that ego work down deep in the earth of the root chakra the element of earth and by doing so working down there in the hot furnaces with all those flames of passion and primal energy that creates the heat to ignite our solar plexus into fire. So the element of earth from the root chakra provides the wood and coals for the fire, and the sacral chakra provides the crude oil to amplify the heat greatly with its primal forces. That's one way you can see it. And it's quite amazing, right, how we progress in this series. We can see the relationships between these centers in the energetic anatomy of our human spirit. And by contemplating them, so many layers of ourselves can be understood and interconnected. So with the solar plexus chakra being like a sun, this center of intelligence is like our awareness the light of our awareness almost, but not the light of pure consciousness, because remember this is a lower chakra, and it is, especially when we're novices, the awareness of our ego. It is our most basic sense of self, and as a result it is where personality resides too. It's our most efficient way of interacting with the physical world, not just through primal animal ways like the root chakra, nor being obsessed with the senses like the sacral, but using both of those and synthesizing them into your will, your willpower as an ego that desires things as a character in this virtual environment of physical life. So the spiritual question of this chakra is, what do you do with these powers and intelligences of life that we saw in the root and sacral chakra? Since this solar plexus governs those chakras that are to do with our emotions and physical life, well, it is up to your decisions, your choices, which are created in the seat of our sense of self within the solar plexus. It is where we form intentions and also carry them out, whether unconsciously or consciously. So this is your everyday sense of self, just as how you're listening to and watching this video now. It's that sense of continual existence and the identity of who you call you and what you believe you are since you remember yourself and the accumulation of your memories in your life. The person you call you, apparently right now, is a spiritual seeker, right? Who doesn't know the mysteries of the universe. It's the play, the actor or actress in this divine comedy of life. The you who is living behind a veil, living behind a mask of a chosen ego that you've formed. This is not a bad thing. This is a necessary part of our nature, the human experience, and an essential part of the rainbow of chakras in order to be a complete human being. But many are stuck at or below and at the mercy of this chakra, which is why there's so much focus on understanding the ego throughout many spiritual teachings and why uh, things like law of attraction are so popular because we're not awakened in this chakra. 
Now, of course, we have another sense of self that is not the ego, right? Our sense of inner divinity, our divine spark, our consciousness. But this is more to do with the higher chakras, which we'll see in the next episodes. And it's also why, in a way, this chakra, you could say, is half lower and also half higher. We're reaching that threshold into higher consciousness. In the sense that, like I said, it is the seat of our will. Meaning that if we're stuck in the root or sacral chakra, it's because we are willing, with certain lower intentions, to negatively feed those lower chakras. The solar plexus is where we are choosing to be a certain way, whether positively or negatively. Obviously here, our intention is to change all that willpower into positive intention, right? In almost every aspect of our life, radically. So, hence, being stuck in the root or sacral chakra means that we are being unconsciously controlled by our unconscious desires. So, we are always manifesting things. The question is, what exactly? I'd say that this chakra is basically a turning point of energy along the process of awakening Kundalini. It's really this centre where most of humanity needs to shift. When there will eventually be some tipping point in the course of humanity's future, however that will happen, there will be a lot of energies and struggles between the solar plexus and the heart centre. We either transcend the solar plexus through the heart, or stay living in the insanities and obsessions of the ego, toying around with the root and sacral chakra, manifesting all these lower realities that are always seen on the news. Uh, More on all of this as we continue. So, as we explored in the first episode, all our chakras are currently overtaken by darkness, by the ego, and so all of the philosophical arguments about whether we have free will or not are just once again two sides of a coin that both have valid realities, meaning those stuck in the first two chakras have little to no free will in their lives. They are simply determined by the psychological makeup of their ego, or you could also say their karma, which is just unconsciously, mechanically fulfilling or trying to fulfill its desires without any involvement of higher consciousness, higher awareness. So this is why some teachings correctly say karma is transcended when you become fully aware and understand it. Because once you become aware of it and understand it, you have the choice, you have the free will to no longer go into that direction. If you don't fully understand it, you'll still be at the mercy of it. So, we're slaves to desire, fear, fearful beliefs, identifications, addictions, obsessions, We readily react or become offended or form opinions that we're willing to defend immediately when we feel attacked, etc. Every time we unconsciously react to a situation impulsively, we are not making a choice to do that in those moments. We're living purely from reaction instead of a clear, conscious response. This is how we stay unaware and unawakened in the solar plexus living from beliefs that we should be or react or act in a certain way, rather than really consciously thinking and contemplating about our life. So accordingly, with balancing this centre, we start to become self-responsible people. Not responsible in the sense that you do your chores in your house or do good in your job, material things like that will naturally happen, but more fundamentally, you become energetically responsible for how your inner state is. And that is far more important than being a domestically responsible person in society. Because to become responsible in this way, spiritually, material responsibility will happen naturally. It will manifest on all physical, social, financial, relationship levels. As within, so without. 
So there's no need to try to be responsible in physical life. Just be responsible from within your own spirituality, from within your own inner world, and everything else will flow naturally. So similarly, in some people who are developed in this chakra, we usually see good traits in their character and people admire them because they don't act like children who don't understand why they feel certain ways about things, but they take full social and spiritual responsibility for their actions and words, never blaming anyone or anything else for the way their experience has turned out in any given situation. This is self-development, which most of us never actually do. This doesn't necessarily have to be a spiritual thing. It can be purely psychological. And so, psychologically, most people never grow up. You know, there's nothing worse than a 14-year-old man in a 40-year-old body. Not much good can come from that. Many people are like this, not developed spiritually. And spiritually, they're still like children, and not children in the innocent, positive sense either. I mean, in the sense of a teenager who's still stuck in the midst of his teenage angst and never really developed beyond it. Becoming an adult on this earth, in this experience of humanity, and taking full responsibility for it with our given limited situation. So by doing all of this, we can see how by transcending our own conditioning and limiting beliefs we accumulated from the world and ourselves, we in turn gain personal power as an individual, rather than having a false sense of identity and power within the dimension of society and collective consciousness and all of the negative energies that come with this hive mind. And in turn, we become confident, self-reliant, and have self-belief in our own abilities to take life on independently. Absolutely not depending on any sort of external guru, spiritual teacher, counsellor, therapist, science, religion, nothing. We start to gain personal power. This is what it means to start to generate that power yourself. You understand how to discover something for yourself. If you want to know something, you want to achieve something, you simply put the desire in and manifestation will turn out in a way in your life that you will move towards a reality where you will discover whatever you want to discover. You don't need a teacher for this. You don't need to seek a guru and spend years going to other countries such as India looking for a guru. You have the guru within you. You have all of the gods, all of the archetypes, all of the spiritual teachers and masters living within your own DNA. And this is something uh, quite related to astral projection as well. If you really want to seek wisdom uh, from divine spiritual masters and things like that, uh, similar to what we saw in the previous episodes, go and explore these other worlds and intend to meet a guru there, a, a master, and they will teach you much more effectively than uh, we can teach in physical life. And of course, I'm not saying uh, having a teacher or a guru is necessarily bad. Uh, I did that too. I longed for a teacher and I found my Gnostic teacher and I learned so much. But as you progress, there's really only so much advancement you can do externally within the interactions of you and your teacher. Teachers and books and videos only really initially act as a catalyst for you to connect to your own inner teacher, your own inner universal intuition. So by becoming a spiritually responsible person who grows up and sorts their inner baggage out, their depression, their anger, their dependencies and attachments, etc., is to slowly walk a path of gradual growing into personal and spiritual freedom, because a spiritually responsible person no longer creates negative ties with people and situations through gossip, insults, drama, negative thoughts, and so on. 
And as a result, there is so much energy freed up in cutting negative ties. If you don't spread out negative thoughts of other people, eventually people will stop putting out negative thoughts about you too. And these negative thoughts, we often attach to them by identifying and reacting towards them emotionally. This limits us in many ways. To just think of one example, you know, how many times have you not done something Thing that you wish you did or knew you should have done it but didn't because of fear or anxiety about what other people would think of you or what they have already said about you and you made that into your own belief about yourself even though you knew deep down it was the right thing to do. If you're not doing or saying something just because you're being limited by the beliefs or imposing restricting thoughts of other people that you negatively feel about, then you're limited yourself. You have a block in your solar plexus because you identify with certain thoughts about yourself. This limits you from living a fuller life. These thoughts that exist within your consciousness can either originally come from you and your own self-pity and self-importance, or they can originally come from negative, unkind, hateful thoughts from other people. And it's not important that other people thought those bad thoughts about you. That's fine. What, what's the problem with people doing that to us? What's important and significant is that you, on some level, believed in it. You may not admit that you believe in it, but you can certainly tell if it's limiting you on a deeper level through the way you feel about it and react towards it. If people insult you and you're able to stay in a peaceful state, well, you've attained a, a good certain level of uh, spiritual advancement there. You know, this is uh, a basic ability that we should have. Why should other thoughts affect us like that? Now, you can perhaps see how we're slowly understanding how this chakra is linked to telepathy. And just before I go on to that, there's a lot of talk sometimes in esoteric and occult groups and even in normal religious groups about black magic or evil people. Well, what I've just been discussing is quite related to that. We like to think of uh, black magic as people dressed in these black robes doing very evil things, right? But really, black magic, in its essence, is within each and every one of us. The average person is a black magician. Now, don't take that out of context. Let me put the context for you because I just want to explain this because I think it's really important and a fundamental part of our reality and understanding how we've come to this point on Earth on a personal and collective level, which... You can really understand if you contemplate uh, what I'm saying here. To give the simplest example is that every time we hatefully talk about another human being is a form of black magic. Our thoughts, our words have vibration and power. To think a negative thought about someone else is one thing as well. But to say it with the power of the word is to manipulate reality on some level, to your own demise, to your own satisfaction and egoic liking. Language and the word, our ability to speak, is a spiritual gift, just as the word of God created the world. Every time we speak badly about someone to someone else, we are encouraging or manipulating the inner world of that person to see that person that you don't like in a negative light. And that can have potentially devastating effects for the person that you do not like, who is just another soul going through the same suffering karmic cycles as you are. And, you know, for some reason, they've done something to annoy you and, you know, you don't like them. But you're adding to the pain by thinking unkindly about them. So as you tell people about this other person that you think is this and you're gossiping and talking about them badly, uh, all of what you're saying is not necessarily the truth as well, especially when it's coming from a negative place within you. Whatever your ego is perceiving about that person 
if you're perceiving it from a negative place, you're probably not seeing the truth at all. The truth can only be perceived from states of higher consciousness, such as peace and compassion. Then we can understand and truly empathize with that person and why they've done actions to annoy you, which is usually because they're in pain, they're in suffering themselves in some form. You don't know what their experience has been or what they've gone through. So we can also apply this to our unconscious negative manipulation of perceiving reality. Commonly seen in when people are complaining about the world, right? People feel so privileged to go around complaining to people and feeling like others must agree with their version of reality as if it's the only truth and nobody questions it. This is how we reverberate a negative hell on this planet by everyone just complaining and telling each other that this is how the world is and we're all unconsciously agreeing. As the shaman Don Juan said, the world is such and such and so and so only because we say it is such and such and so and so. And if you're a powerful person and everyone listens to you and follows you and you're in a position of power, right? Well, if you're telling everyone uh, sort of negative things about reality, uh, this is black magic too. I know it sounds extreme, but that's simply the nature of humanity today, embedded in the gross darkness of just wrong perceptions of the great reality cutting us off from the great reality. Uh, Let me give you another example. Black magic is when a parent tells a child he can never do or achieve something with his life. It's when a parent, who is in a position of power over that child, calls their child an idiot, and that child becomes sad with bad self-esteem and grows up believing at least subconsciously, that he is an idiot. That's black magic. Black magic is when you affect other people's lives like this. That parent has changed the course of that child's life forever in a negative way. Unless, of course, that child miraculously, hopefully, finds himself spiritually and frees himself from those spells that were cast on him unconsciously. But of course, most people never even hear about how to do this or don't even think about it in just normal conversation as we're doing here. So we can ask all of this and explore all of this ourselves and apply this understanding to analysing our own life, self-inquiring and asking ourselves uh, things like, as a child... What kind of thoughts did I accumulate about reality when I was growing up? What kind of beliefs did I form about myself? Where did those beliefs and thoughts come from? Did I form them myself? If so, how did I come to believe that? Or did these beliefs come from my parents or classmates? If so, why did I take them on so unconsciously? And most importantly, are all of these thoughts and beliefs really true? Do I still act them out to this day? Do they determine my emotions and thoughts about reality? 30 or 40 years later, how have they determined my life, health, self-esteem, relationships, circumstances, and my potential for spiritual abilities. If you're not conscious about most of those questions, you have so much wonderful self-discovery to make and you can certainly devote time for you and finding yourself more through reflecting and contemplating about your life. You can think about them on long walks or meditation or whatever. As long as you have an active interest in it, the answers will come eventually through synchronicity. Synchronicity just means that you are currently holding within your vibration, certain interests to discover certain things. 
and you are okay with the not knowing immediately, but are patient. And as you continue life, you find the answers in your day-to-day experience. Experience, or to gain experience, meaning wisdom. Wisdom is experience. Or, more precisely, conscious experience. Proactively pursuing interests. And those interests are first born in the solar plexus chakra, within the realms of our desires, from our ego. Okay? So as we're going to see now, the ego is not just something we just need to completely disdain and crucify, but we actually need to use it as well. We use it to manifest many things in life, right? We use it to make money, we use it to uh, become famous and other materialistic things, so why can't we use it for spiritual progression? We can, which we'll see in a little bit. So we can also do this sort of life review in a ritualistic way, which in shamanism is called recapitulation, where you intensely reflect with insight on the memories of your life. And then, when you've fully understood it, you can write those experiences down in a ritualistic way, and then burn what you wrote with the intention to erase, to release all of the baggage and noise and limiting energies of the past. The past literally not actually being real, the past just exists as memories, as energies in the body that we unfortunately identify and take a sense of self in and thus limits us energetically. So that's already a practice I recommend to recapitulate your life through meditative reflection. And if you had very traumatic experiences that you're particularly still struggling to process, then Do this in a ritualistic way, passionately and emotionally writing down everything, like a journal. And then when you feel you're ready to let it all go after reflecting, meditating, processing, you may even cry, you then burn it all in a fire as an act of power. I'll leave some shamanistic links in the description below if you're interested in this. So to continue more about our self-will in this solar plexus chakra, we begin to contemplate and self-inquire into how do we understand what we are actively willing in our lives, or more precisely, why we are doing what we're doing, or even more precisely, what particular psychological sense of self is making us play out certain actions, feelings, and behaviours? What particular egos are creating movements within the energy of ourselves? For example, we tell ourselves we like to do spiritual practices, right? Well, who is saying that within ourselves? Why is it saying that? What are the real motives there? Just to be a more spiritual person or to genuinely find enlightenment? So, this is just one I, right? One voice that says, I want to do this. The problem is, there are so many other eyes and desires within us that we end up seeking advice saying, how can I devote more time to spiritual practice? I find myself doing other things. Well, this can't be solved with another fancy routine from another life coach who's going to give you a system he's developed. I guarantee that's not the solution. It could work out for a bit because he's more developed, he's mastered this solar plexus chakra more and it's inspiring to you and he gives you motivation, but take him out of the picture and you'll fall back into your normal old ways. So we need to become self-reliant and if you really want to know why you procrastinate, why you have multiple conflicting desires and emotions, then you have to look within, you have to meditate, then you'll know directly Nobody, no book, no guru can tell you why you're failing in whatever enterprise you're undertaking. Because you make the mistakes, only you can discover that for yourself within. So this is all about, you know, growing our awareness, our self-awareness, becoming a more fully cognizant human being and really knowing at a fundamental core level what our desires are. Because... 
one thing wants to do one thing, another something else. We swear to stay married to one person, but not realising other desires are within us. We say we want to take on a certain hobby, but then the next day we do something else. We're fickle, indecisive. And so to work in this chakra is also to become a spiritual warrior because you have to learn to fight against yourself and your natural impulses. It's a constant struggle, especially when we first begin. This is really why the symbolism of the fight between good and evil has manifested throughout all teachings, fairy tales, stories, superhero movies. Uh, a good example would be like Neo and Agent Smith out of The Matrix. This common theme is just a reflection of this aspect of war within us. And remember, Neo never actually defeats Agent Smith, Agent Smith representing the ego, but Neo just becomes infinitely more stronger by fighting him. It's not that we necessarily need to win every battle, but that we become stronger and more formidable as a result. So it's not really healthy to just see the ego as this filthy, sinful, evil thing. It can actually help us. It can be a spiritual teacher, a guru in a way, an evil guru, you could say, by showing us all the evil within us. So we have to use it in this way, and we have to be willing to face it, to fight it, as a sort of worthy opponent in a great game of chess. This is actually what chess means on a spiritual level, to be calculative and strategic with winning the battle for our soul. And recall how Agent Smith is not just one, but he multiplies into many. As we've been exploring, the ego is many, a legion, and pops up everywhere as we continue on the path. And as we understand our own psychology much more deeply, we begin to reveal the ego's secrets, and we slowly gain the capacity to not talk to ourselves or think in a limited, linguistic way like the ego does, but we communicate with ourselves through much more refined intelligence that transcends ordinary egoic logic. So relatedly, this is also to do with telepathy because we start to understand why and how we operate, how the ego operates. And how does the ego operate? Does it operate with higher consciousness? No, it operates as a sort of foreign entity, a sort of mechanical creature, a robot. It's our own artificial intelligence within us. And thus, to understand this ego, with all of its psychological voices, with all of its own logic and reasonings, we also begin to understand how to communicate much more efficiently, in a more refined and direct way. Because through direct understanding, we can synthesize all of this logic of the ego. This is literally what it means to be intelligent. Uh, but we'll see more directly how this applies to telepathy towards the end. Right now, our solar plexus chakra is... Um, how should I say, grossly using lower forms of logic that is not aligned with universal truth and consciousness. And as we balance this centre of intelligence, we purify our logic, our reason, and we're able to use it much more efficiently. It's basically like taking a slow semi-useful dump truck and transforming it into technology that is extremely advanced, uh, like turning it into a UFO. So this is how we can understand that our ego is not something totally evil. It's just completely out of control. It's turned into an ugly monster. And yes, as we've been exploring, it is necessary to kill, even cruelly and aggressively, certain parts of our ego to really get it under control. Those parts that are just disgusting, unnecessary, 
that make our life and the lives of others literally a living hell. Jealousy, hate, violence, and all of that kind of ugliness and grotesqueness, right? And we work on the most destructive parts first, and then we refine from there. Remember, the lower chakras are a sort of gross laboratory deep down within. We refine the material slowly and slowly and just keep working. And as we do, we begin to change. We begin to transform our ego. We transform it from a miserable, petty, bitter monster to a good, upright, virtuous, kind character. Actually, this links very well to an astral projection experience I shared on this channel where I met a spiritual master who held a class and she gave everyone wooden masks which she turned to gold, symbolising that we should transform our ego into something pure and more useful. Uh, that's on the screen if you're interested in hearing that. There's also a Buddhist image which I love and will complement beautifully what I'm saying. I'll put it on the screen now. It really depicts this not so much destruction of the ego, but discipline over it. As you can see, there we are at the bottom right, us as our self, as conscious awareness, and there are some black animals who are running wild and rampant and who are currently leading and controlling our lives, trying to fulfill all of its desires and chaotic behaviours, leaving us to eat the dirt and dust behind them bitterly, struggling to gain any form of control over them. But if we continue to strive to get some form of control, you can see that the animals eventually become more white, more purified, and as they become more well behaved, we are able to become their master, instead of them mastering us. And eventually towards the top, as they simply follow us like good, peaceful animals, we can use them to fly and ascend into the heavens. So you might be wondering, wait, we use the ego? Yes, very much so. As we explored earlier, the ego is a necessary aspect of our being, which we use to walk the path and interact with the world and others. To not have some form of purified ego, at the very least, would essentially mean not to be human in this human experience. So the spiritual path is very much always labelled as something very good, or we have to become like good gods, right? Uh, but God doesn't mean good or bad, it means beyond good and bad, both of them. So really, in order to transcend on the path, we don't just become lords of the heavens, but we also become lords of the underworld too. All the spiritual masters, uh, all the ascended beings, such as Jesus, Buddha, etc., they all have command over hell, over demons too. They're not just eating grapes and being served by nice angels and things like that. They're, they also rule the underworld as well. So I made a video uh, when I was living in South Korea and I visited a Buddhist temple at the top of a mountain, and I showed you how this Buddhist statue has demons under the Buddha, which represents Buddha's domination over the negative dimensions of nature. Uh, that's on the screen now, if you'd like to watch that later. So, as it says in the Bible, Except ye be converted, and become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. So this is about transforming the monstrous ego with all of its vices, wickedness, negative states of mind, of consciousness, and transforming, transmuting, converting it back into a state of innocence, a state of purity, like little children. This is how we gain clarity in our life, by cleaning all of that muck, or else we won't be able to enter the kingdom of heaven. 
In chakra and kundalini terms, that means not being able to transcend or ascend past the level of our solar plexus chakra because of our own egoic monsters which reside there, which is not an innocent little child yet. And so how do we transform it? Well, as we saw in the previous episode, we stop nourishing it with its appetites, desires, and passions. And by doing that, it not only dies and experiences an ego death, as some will say, but it becomes smaller and more beautiful and more agreeable. It begins to serve us, its master, instead of us serving it. In Christian terms, we understand the ego as Satan. Thus, the solar plexus chakra is also where the ego lives. And so in the book of Revelation, with the solar plexus chakra representing the church of Pergamos, it says, To the angel of the church in Pergamos, he which hath the sharp sword with two edges, I know your works, and where thou dwellest even where Satan's seat is. The sharp sword with two edges points towards the fact that we can use this church, this energy centre, to either will to do good or to do evil. So as you see, we need an ego, but a refined, upright and disciplined one to operate in the world and be a medium through which we interact with our ascension. We learn to become a master puppeteer, learning to move our puppet with strings, controlling our thoughts, deeds, desires, and body in a disciplined, upright way. Similarly, the solar plexus chakra is also commonly related to the god Agni, the god of fire which restores our spiritual powers. Notice how this god is riding a goat or a ram, with this animal with its horns being commonly related to Satan or the ego throughout various spiritual schools. Now remember that we've got all of this ego within us, taking its own will and desires to think and feel in certain ways. And remember how we visualized our inner lake of emotion in the previous episode, and how certain negative emotions would look, which are impure, dirty, destructive, not life-giving, but, you know, just stagnant, dry or rotten, well, it is within our solar plexus chakra where our ego or unconscious will creates these emotions, these forms of water, and these negative forms of water, these emotions, lead to illnesses and diseases because negative emotion never feels good in the body, right? Just notice after you've had a bout of anger how you feel. It's horrible. It leads to disease because of dis-ease in the body, because of what are literally pollutions in the body. All of the pollutions on the earth now is simply an external reflection, an external manifestation of our inner spiritual pollution within our inner worlds. Accordingly, to balance and master this solar plexus chakra is to master what kind of thoughts and emotions we will have. And if we have a bit of common sense about us, we will never choose to feel any kind of dis-ease. Hence, this chakra is often related to overcoming sicknesses and leading to perfect health and longevity. This is known as the Patala Siddhi. A Siddhi is a Sanskrit word that means to have a spiritual power or ability, usually attained from yoga. And the Patala Siddhi means the yogi becomes a master of desire, meaning he's fully able to control or destroy desires, sorrows and diseases as he pleases because he understands them energetically, directly. And to be a master of this will is also to understand how to will to manifest anything, whether it be other spiritual powers or physical wealth. But can we use this power to just do absolutely anything we want? Even if it's evil or morally wrong or materialistic? Well, this is how the spiritual path 
and the universe works in a beautiful way to only be of goodness and uprightness, because as we explored before, in order to achieve mastery in desire, will, and manifestation, we have to become responsible people, and not sort of, uh, you know, black magicians. So as the saying goes, with great power comes great responsibility. Uh, an ancient proverb, by the way, it's not from Spider-Man, if that came to your mind. When taken seriously, it's a very significant piece of truth. So, to put it simply, the universal laws work in a way that if you use your power for evil, they'll eventually be taken away from you because of the limiting karma that you create for yourself. Okay, so let's get on to some practices. Uh, Ah, just before I do, let me explain how this solar plexus chakra is connected to telepathy. Now, this is the Gnostic understanding, okay? The solar plexus chakra receives impressions, mental impressions, of people's thoughts and emotions. In other words, this chakra is an antenna for receiving signals from other people. We don't receive thoughts through our intellectual centre. That would be sort of ridiculous, because as we explored in the previous episodes, the intellectual centre just isn't fast enough, nor is it capable of sensing a lot of data at the same time. So this solar plexus chakra is a receptor, a receiver, and our pineal gland is the transmitter, the sender, where we send out thoughts to others and into the world. The solar plexus receives mental waves from people who think of us, and then those waves pass into our brain. This happens all the time, we just don't notice it, or haven't gained the discernment between external receptive signals and internal fantasies. And of course, those impressions we receive can easily turn into skewed subjective fantasies when we see them in our mind's eye, when they travel to the brain. And since they're coming from the solar plexus region within us, we think that we're thinking them ourselves, but we're not. So, the solar plexus is our telepathic brain of emotions. Hence, telepathy, as discussed previously, is communication on a deeper level, on an emotional level, emotional data. You know when a person is saying one thing, but you can just feel they actually mean something else completely? If we were just animals who purely relied on the words someone said, we would never come to any truth of, you know, what people actually mean. Another example would be being able to know what someone's going to say just before they say it. Well, if you'd like to learn a little bit more about telepathy, I made a video about that in the context of realizing this ability in the context of astral projection. But it isn't too important to understand the technicalities. This is just something that naturally arises and that we become aware of as we refine our inner state, and especially as we become more silent within. When we achieve inner silence, then we start to become more sensitive to these vibrations of other people. Okay, so let's get on to the practical part. As for the main sound, the main vowels that I'm teaching here for each chakra, and that we saw the root chakra mantra is the sound of S, and the sacral chakra is the sound of the letter M. Now, the solar plexus chakra is the vowel U, the letter U, but we don't say U like you or me, we just phonetically vocalize the pure sound of the letter U, which is U. Okay? Not O, but O. I'll demonstrate it now. O. And of course, as taught previously, you can keep your awareness in the solar plexus region and you can visualize a yellow circular disc spinning clockwise. You don't have to visualize anything. You don't have to keep awareness there. But 
it is there if you would like to exercise your attention more thoroughly. So we have some other very powerful mantras here that we're going to see, um, but there's also one very basic thing we should strive to do every day as well for this chakra. I know it's not easy sometimes because of COVID, but getting sunlight. This chakra is the element of fire, and the sun is the greatest source of spiritual fire that we can soak into our system. The element of fire is just wonderful in almost every way for us. Everyone likes the sun, right? Just go into any usually miserable city and see what the people are like when it's sunny. Everyone is smiling and happy. Uh, perhaps you can't see the contrast in that in your own life because you live in a sunny country all the time. So perhaps people are more angry there. But for me, I can see the contrast very well because I grew up in cloudy and rainy England. So fire, sun wonderful, we need it, it empowers us, it is life-affirming and just gives life to every part of our energy system too. Our inner element of earth needs the sun, so does water, so does air, okay? So accordingly, we have another particular mantra for this chakra. It is called a bija mantra. Bija means seed in Sanskrit. There is actually a bija mantra for every chakra, which you can see on the screen now. However, we're not teaching them here, which I'll explain why, but we make an exception for the solar plexus because the solar rays and the element of fire, as I've just said, is just something our whole system needs and it is also related to awakening the heart center. Remember, the sun is the center of our soul system. As above, so below. Our heart is the center that gives life to the whole of the physical body, our inner solar system. And the sun and heart are also intimately tied to the zodiacal sign Leo, which is depicted by the fiery, brave hearted lion. So the heart is just, it self empowers us, which we really need to walk this path. The reason why we generally don't use seed mantras for the other chakras, which of course you absolutely can if you like, is that seed mantras relate to giving power to our chakras. They are fuel for the chakras. This is different to what we want to achieve on a deeper level. What we want to achieve on a deeper level is to transform and heal our actual chakras directly so that they are aligned with divinity. You see, our chakras are currently dormant, imbalanced or malfunctioning. We need to fix them first before we put fuel in them. Bija mantras don't necessarily fix them. So if our chakras are inverted or asleep, stimulating the chakras with bija power, seed power, will have little or poor effect. Instead, we want to transform and fix the chakra itself. Remember, as we explored in the first episode, our chakras are already active, just in a negative way. We don't need much seed power because we already have our seed, which is our sexual energy, which is always being generated. So if you're maybe older and you feel you're lacking in a uh, virility and sexual energy. Uh, you can use these seed mantras actually, which will help you invigorate your system and healing your etheric and physical body a bit more, okay? And so you can relate all this to like having a car. If the engine is not working, the chakra not working, or other parts are broken, why would you keep putting fuel in it, putting seed in it? Or worse, think about who is driving the car, driving the chakra. If the ego is driving the car and you give it fuel, then this is obviously not desired either. The main mantras being taught in this series are intended to fix your car back into a pure state. Then your natural energy will do the rest. Again, you can certainly use the seed mantras if you like, but keep in mind the purpose of chanting them probably best to use them later in your practice. So simply put, this seed mantra for the solar plexus is for giving us more fire, more willpower for our ego to get off its lazy ass and actually do something about spirituality, okay? So the Bija mantra for the solar plexus is Ram. Notice how this chakra is related to the god Agni the god of fire, who is riding a ram. So, it is pronounced by either 
rolling the R or not. I'll demonstrate both. And you can, if you're comfortable with it, invoke the god Agni who exists within you to help you awaken this great fiery chakra. It's said that if we achieve to be able to see this god within deep meditation, we'll see him with a very bright aura. And the aura also produces a majestic music. And similar to how the element of fire gives life to all the other chakras, it also does to our spiritual bodies too, such as the etheric body and astral body, giving us health and spiritual realization. So fire is the basis of our spiritual experience. Uh, other deities that you may resonate with that are commonly linked to this chakra are Vishnu and the goddess Lakshmi as well. And for people with Christian preferences, you can focus on the crucifix, symbolizing the fiery death or transformation of Christ and the ego. Remember that on the crucifix, above Jesus's head, or Yeshua's head, it says Inri, which is actually another fire-related mantra. Inri is a Latin acronym which stands for Ignis Natura Renovata Integra, which means nature is completely renewed by fire. In other words, our inner nature is rebirthed anew through the power of fire and its rebirthing transformative qualities. Notice how the name of the god Agni is similar to Ignis. Agni actually has the root meaning of ignite, hence why the god Agni is not just a god of fire, but the igniter of fire. Now, we have another mantra for this chakra called Swa, S-U-A. Let me demonstrate it first and then I'll explain it. Su This mantra calls upon the fire of kundalini in the root to awaken with the S part. Then, U, as we saw, is the main vowel for this chakra. And R is actually related to two elements, the element of air and also of akash. Because what does fire need? It needs oxygen in the air. Thus, the R vowel is related to the lungs. And also, an extra bonus here, the mantra R can be used for a practice in and of itself if you are working towards recalling your past lives. Because we need the element of Akash, which is a subtle etheric element to be able to recall our past lives. The Akash is where we go to and come back from through life and death. And connecting with that helps us to recall past lives. And so using the Swa mantra can also help bring heat and air and spiritual life into our own Akash. Now, to go into an even more powerful mantra, and especially if you want to focus on and invoke the deity of Agni for assistance, you can use the mantra Ramswa, which is a combination of the two above. I'm not just randomly putting them together, this is what was taught in the Gnostic tradition. So let me demonstrate this mantra for you. Ram 
So clearly, this is a powerful mantra if you want to awaken this chakra. It has the Bija seed mantra as well as the Swa mantra with its combination of the main vowels to boost it into awakening and transformation. Okay, so another practice similar to the previous episode where we visualized fire to burn out certain negative impressions on our consciousness, well, in essentially the same way, we can actually use the element of fire in physical life by gazing at fire, or more specifically, a candle. This can actually be very healing to merge with the fire and disintegrate old patterns or traumas. So we simply get a white candle to symbolize purity and we sit comfortably in front of the candle and we simply meditate as normal except we keep the eyelids slightly open gazing at the flame, admiring it, contemplating the element of fire in life. Not thinking, just really consciously seeing it, noticing its different shades of colours, the aura and heat it creates around it, the stillness of it and how it dances. It can be very beautiful. And so as we gaze, we fixate on it as our anchor of attention. And when a thought comes in, we can visualise or send that thought gently into the flame to be burned and dissolved and we continue to do that with any disturbances that arise from within that keep recurring you just keep going at it sending them all into the fire you can come to a very profound stillness through this. It's a wonderful type of meditation. I recommend it to everyone. It's somewhat easier to meditate like this too at times because we're so used to quickly daydreaming when we close our eyes. But if we keep them open, it easily keeps us grounded in our here and now physical environments. This also hugely increases your concentration span. Most people can't focus on one thing without breaking their attention for more than 30 seconds. But if you can attain a long length of deep attention, well, your whole life is going to change. Apply this kind of attention to every moment in your life, no matter where you are. You will experience life in beautifully transcendental ways you never thought were possible that words cannot express. If you're interested in astral projection too, doing this will also increase your ability to stay in an experience for much longer than usual due to your newfound strength in concentration. Instead of just going into dreams and getting lost in dreams while you're trying to be, you know, conscious in the astral. And as you may have wondered, this Candle gazing meditation can of course be combined with any of the mantras we've just discussed, or focusing on the deities or archetypes that we just discussed. We should also incorporate into our daily lives stretching our spine, particularly for this chakra. Simply stand up straight on your feet, place your hands on your waist, and rotate your hips in a clockwise motion. This will help you to keep the elasticity in your spinal column. You can also, while standing up straight vertically, raise your arms up, reaching for the sky, inhale and bend backwards as much as comfortably possible. Then go all the way forward while exhaling, touching or trying to touch your feet while keeping the legs straight. And really any way that you can stretch the muscles around the spine and higher back will help to allow arising impurities to find their natural flow and release. You see there's a certain struggle between our solar plexus and heart, you see. In a big sense, you may have noticed how powerful this chakra is and its potential and how it's the source of many spiritual powers and material powers and you know not just telepathy is involved but clairvoyance clairaudience and other psychic powers are attained from the fuel and willpower of the solar plexus energy center so this chakra is more like 
half inferior, half superior. It can be either depending on our intentions and hence why it's very common for people to abuse their powers. Why do they do this? Those people who are developed in this chakra but abuse it or use their powers in a wrong way. It's because they're still stuck in this chakra and have not yet developed or ascended to the heart chakra. And many struggle to ascend higher because of the top part of this solar plexus chakra, which is guarded by our biggest fears. This has been known in the occult as the guardian of the threshold, because at the top of this chakra is sort of a little gate, the threshold of the ego, you could say. And if we pass through that, we can reach the first and most important superior chakra, the heart chakra, which is essentially the guide, the direction for our solar plexus chakra, which has all this infinite potential. The heart chakra will show us what we should be manifesting and which direction we should go. But if we want to ascend to that, then we will usually be tested in some way by the fires of our biggest fears, temptations and our general greatest personal struggles in order to see if we're truly ready to start living from a higher state of consciousness from the heart. But of course we shall go in depth into the heart chakra on the next episode. In the meantime, if you'd like to chat about all of this in our friendly group in our Patreon Discord, feel free. We had a wonderful voice chat last Sunday which lasted around three hours and we covered a lot of great questions. Uh, if you're interested, check out the link at the bottom of the description. A shout out to Lorenko, Karen, Emin, Gary, Ali, Dan, Donamic, Fred and Maya who all joined on Patreon this week. Thank you everyone and see you in the Heart Chakra episode.